Good morning, everyone. While, uh, while my panelists are, my distinguished panelists are getting settled in, why don't I just uh, deal with the housekeeping issues? Um, this is, uh, the session is on the record and it's being live webcasted on uh, www.vratswafglobalforum.com. Please uh, remember to turn the, the ring on your phone off, if you could. Um, and you can engage in uh, Twitter by using the hashtag WGF16. Uh, we have a, an interesting question that, uh, that we're posing to you for this panel. Since the panel's title is The Future of Europe, Democracy and Society Under Pressure, uh, the Twitter poll question for this panel is, where do you see Europe headed over the next 10 years? And uh, you're given uh, four choices, increasing fragmentation, two-speed Europe, ever closer union, or other. Um, I, I am David Ensor, as was mentioned. I'm uh, the executive vice president, one of the, one of the executive vice presidents of, of the Atlantic Council handling external relations. Um, some of you may be saying, where do I know that guy from? And the answer is I was on television for over 30 years. Um, I, I was a CNN correspondent, uh, and I worked at ABC News and National Public Radio as well. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here, uh, on, uh, to be talking on this subject with such a distinguished group of, of people. Um, the future of Europe is, is so important to humanity um, and so apparently uncertain today. Um, the, it's so, so much so that many of us on the, living on the other side of the Atlantic worry about it almost as much as you dear, do over here. Uh, in, in Hanover, Germany, Germany recently, President Obama called this a defining moment for Europe. Um, you are our biggest trading partners, our closest allies. We are each other's biggest investors. Americans share more values and more history with Europeans than with anyone else. We have, many of us share ties of blood and family, myself included. So, as I say, I'm particularly honored to be here today. The headlines have been relentless. Greece and the Eurozone crisis. Terrorism on the streets of Paris and Brussels. Russian aggression in the East civil war in Syria and the largest human migration since World War II, not to mention fierce debates over national sovereignty versus the power of Brussels. We even have the paradox right now of Ukrainians wanting into Western institutions like the EU at the same time as British voters are deciding whether to leave it. What should we make of all this? What should Europeans do? Our distinguished panel will help us look for answers today and I think we can expect an interesting range of views uh, uh, along the line here. Uh, we have Dr. Zdzisław Krasnodiewski, one of the key thinkers behind the ruling Law and Justice Party here in Poland. He's a member of the European Parliament. Konrad Szymański, who is Poland's Secretary of State for European Affairs. Ivana klimpusz tinsadze who is Ukraine's Vice Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration, who was first elected to the Ukrainian Parliament in 2014. And from Portugal, we're joined by Ana Gomes at the far end. Uh, Gomes, Gomes, I think. Gomes. Gomes. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm still uh, not perfect on all of the languages here. Um, she is a long-standing member of the European Parliament, first elected back in 2004. And we have a strong addition to the panel today, which we're very pleased to to uh, to be able to to tell you. Uh, welcoming from Germany, um, uh, Dr. Horst Telchik who served during a critical time in history as the National Security Advisor to then Chancellor Helmut Kohl. Uh, he, since he's not in the program, I'll just say a little bit more about him. He, he chaired the Munich Conference on Security Policy for nine years. He's a former president of Boeing Germany and number two of Boeing International. He served on the board of BMW. He was the CEO of Bertelsmann Foundation. So a very, very distinguished resume. Uh, for this uh, uh, panel edition. Since this is a big, a big panel, I'm going to ask uh, uh, the members to keep their comments on the side of brevity and try to make this more of a conversational uh, discussion. Uh, so we have plenty of time for questions from the audience. But um, nonetheless, I'd like to begin, if that's all right with you, slightly contravening the rules here, uh, by, by uh, having us all listen for just a few minutes to my colleague, who I haven't mentioned yet, of my Atlantic Council colleague, Matt Burroughs, second from the end, who's the director of our Strategic Foresight Initiative. Uh, Matt is a veteran U.S. government foreign policy analyst who was on the National Intelligence Council staff for many years and was principal drafter of Global Trends to the, uh, 2030 Alternative Worlds. Um, the council doesn't take public positions, but Matt has been looking at the trends 
for Europe, and I think his findings may give our, our colleagues on the panel something to react to. So, Matt, why don't you lead off and just give us a, a quick view of what you see as some of the major trends affecting Europe. Well, thanks, um, David. And um, as David said, we're as interested in Europe, I think, as, as Europeans are. So I wanted to give you just kind of the top level of some trends I see. And we'll start first, we can get this, looking at the future, the long-term future, and where Europe is and actually where the US is. So increasingly, Europe is a minority. You can say the same thing about the US. The difference with, between the US and Europe is you're going to have several European countries that are actually going to be declining in population. That's because of long-term low birth rates, 1.6 or below in some cases. US, because of immigration, large-scale immigration in the 1990s, has actually a higher birth rate but is coming down. Now, obviously the big issue in the last year has been about migrants. This actually shows degree to which Europe can't function without migrants. It's broken down looking at both other EU citizens that immigrate from one country to another. These are five or four of the principal European economies and also those coming from outside. You know, one thing that's very interesting is the, the large proportion of those immigrants actually who are working, you hear a lot of the rhetoric that, that they are a burden on social welfare programs, et cetera. They do bring their families as the, some of the, the, the color, the, the pastel color or those that aren't working shows, but nevertheless, the large proportion are, are working. And then if you're looking at the future, because of declining population, because of declining working age population, and that's going down very dramatically in the 2020s, you actually need the migrants. You know, I know this goes completely counter to all the rhetoric mm -hmm. you hear today about how the burden is so great. But for both of our countries, or both Europe and the US, you actually, immigration is a godsend. Mm -hmm. So this was mentioned in one of the other panels, but Europe has been on a declining uh, when you're comparing its growth with the U.S., so declining trend actually from the, from the late 1980s. Um, and that's real, very much concerning that, that you don't see actually a, a tick up. And certainly since 2008, Europe has lost ground. When you're looking, and we had the last panel looking at a broader global economy with the rise of, of powers like China, India, and others, one of the things that is very disconcerting is basically that Europe's R&D spending is falling compared to countries like China. And when you're looking to the future, as we've been talking here, high tech really is a very important part of the economy. R&D is, is the setup for that, for that high tech. Also, with increasing economic power elsewhere in the world, you're seeing basically here, particularly China, uh, spending a lot more on military. U.S. remains the largest by far, 34 uh, percent, but China, some of the other countries in uh, the Middle East, Gulf states are also coming up and spending more. Europe's uh, portion has is, is been diminishing. So if you're looking at conflict and failing states, Europe unfortunately is ringed. We've talked a lot about um, issues with Russia, with uh, in, the, in the direction of the eastern direction, but if you look south, Middle East, Africa, you're, you're actually also seeing this uptick in conflict due in part to, to, to failing states. The problem here is that, you know, we, we got lulled into, after the end of the Cold War for a decade or two, you actually saw conflicts coming down. 
So now we're facing this problem of actually increasing conflict, particularly in the Middle East. And with that conflict, what we've seen actually in the last couple decades is much higher levels of refugees. Academics are still debating why this is the case, because obviously we had civil wars before that. You didn't see refugees, the numbers of refugees at the same scale. But in the past decade or two, you're actually seeing this much higher level of, of refugees, most of them still moving within the country, but nevertheless increasing numbers also leaving. And the final um, graph here is looking at our own situation in the U.S. Um, we also have an aging problem, and that is because the booming gener boomer generation, which is such a huge bulge if you look at across the board on U.S. population, is moving into its retirement uh, years. That also means that spending on health is going up, and we particularly, as Anders was saying yesterday, we spend an incredible amount of our GDP on health, 17 to 18 percent. So if you're looking out as the population begins to age, that goes up. Also pensions, social security. The other big portion of this is servicing for the debt. And if interest rates go up, then obviously that portion goes up. What you have left is increasingly a sliver. And that's the discretionary, that's defense departments in there, but also education. So the worry, if you'd looked at European, uh, had a graph on European, it would be similar in the, in the sense that you're really seeing a squeeze on that discretionary spending. So in, in, in addition to defense and the pressure there, credible pressure on things like R&D and education. And since those are really the future for all of us, this is not a very, good, very nice picture. And I'll end there. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'd like to turn uh, first, perhaps, to one of our hosts uh, here in Poland, uh, Mr. Szymanski. Uh, since you are uh, in the government of the country we're, we're now in, I, I, t talk to us a little bit about uh, your government's view of the uh, demographic challenges for Europe that, uh, that Matt outlined. Uh, you, your government hasn't been interested in accepting refugees from Syria and elsewhere. What, what is your thought about some of these issues that, we, that the continent faces? And also, uh, how can the um, trend towards European integration that we used to see and perhaps is now in question, how can that be revived in your view? Yeah, I'm still thinking about the statistics. I think it's relatively easy today to find a statistics which would illustrate a rather gloomy picture of our future. And of course, we can stay with this and say, okay, we have to wait and see what could happen. Uh, it is not my position, for sure. I don't know the future, of course, mm. but I believe that a lot of things depends on us and on our institutions. We used to believe that our sophisticated uh, regulation, legislation, our efficient administration, um, political culture as well, can, could play an enormous role to find the proper solutions for everything, for every kind of crisis. And it used to be very good, a very efficient way of thinking about the, the future. I, I would like to follow this paradigm. It, it's true that we are very hesitant about uh, the simple solutions, especially when we touch the migration crisis, because there is no such a thing like a migrant. We are talking about the people with a different capacities, different backgrounds, different education, different aspirations. Uh, so maybe not one by one, but we should talk about the migration in terms of different streams or different uh, part, different groups of, of migration. And in case of Poland, our labor market and society itself uh, is very welcoming for a great migratory flow from east, where there is no any, probably any risk of any kind of uh, um, risk for social cohesion or any kind of 
cultural competition or any kind of uh, failure in um, migration policy. So it is not the case that we are not aware about the problems we should solve in terms of demographic crisis which affect Poland as well. But we are very sensitive about the experience we already have in Europe, the experience of the migration from the Middle East, which sometimes is very, very successful, and we know the countries with a lot of experience of uh, social interaction or political interaction with the Middle East and very successful stories of uh, cohabitation and maybe even more than cohabitation of the communities from Middle East in Europe. But we also, we are also aware about the problems which could occur and has occurred already in Europe um, because of probably legitimate aspirations of some communities uh, already present in, in Europe. That's why we believe that uh, migratory policy should be uh, much more sophisticated and much more selective. And that's why we believe that uh, from the European perspective, we need to, um, to elaborate policies which would uh, understand, which would take into account the fact that the migration absorption capacity of different member states is different. Because uh, of obvious reasons. We have different uh, migra migratory policy in uh, Iberian uh, countries, we have different uh, migration experience in the South, we, we have different migration experience in the Central uh, East European countries, and it should be noticed uh, when policy will be uh, defined at the European level. Otherwise, we risk uh, um, beloved Brussels method, uh, one uh, fit uh, for all scenario, which doesn't work in many, many other aspects. And it doesn't work in migration for sure, because migration affects uh, an, almost all aspect of social and cultural life. Uh, and it is a serious thing. It is not a technical thing. So we have to be very careful, because otherwise we can't provoke reactions based on the feeling of insecurity um, which could be treated as unproportional or, or not very objective, but it's, it's a social reality. The feeling of insecurity in Europe is a background for um, political disintegration in many, many uh, member states, not in case of Poland. Um, and it is the, the, the vital risk for the whole project. That's why we advise Brussels to be a little bit more sensitive and to shape the policy in a, in a much more diversified method, uh, which is, in my mind, it, it's, a, it's a good advice for the whole adaptation of the European integration. And we, we easily talk about the adaptation of NATO. This, is, this word is well defined in terms of NATO future. We should start thinking about the adaptation of the European Union, and this adaptation should be based, uh, among many other things probably, should be based on more diversified approach to different member states, different regions, and different experience. Mm -hmm. um, Ana Gomez, you, you, uh, you come at this question from a different part of Europe and another angle. Um, I know you have criticized the deal made with Turkey by the European Council, uh, under which the number of migrants is supposed to be greatly reduced, and I think you've even talked of suing the EU over the matter. Uh, what's your perspective on the, on the migrant issue? Well, my perspective is that the kind of pressures we are facing in democracy and society in, in Europe are largely self-inflicted. They come from unemployment. It's not just the result of uh, globalization, new technologies. It's actually wrong uh, policies to deal with the economic crisis, lack of, in, of investment, namely public investment. And uh, of course, a limping euro, a limping uh, banking euro, uh, union. It's uh, the f sense of fostering uh, inequality that is very present in the reaction of the middle classes, anti establishment. It's not just in the United States with Trump, it's here as well. I mean, the, the populists, the, 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 the perspective of uh, uh, Trump, but as well on this side, Le Pen or a Boris in the UK are the result of that kind of, uh, of uh, revolt of the middle classes that have a lot to do with a sense as well of injustice, not just unemployment, but injustice. For instance, uh, that, that the LuxLeaks scandal 
uh, and the Panama Papers, what they reveal that indeed we, by keeping the, all this tax haven system and so on, we are actually abetting the, the, the proceeds of corruption, not just uh, of many kleptocracies. Uh, in, in the European Union, uh, but actually the, 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 the gap between the haves and the have-nots has been widening. And of course that fuels in the sense of insecurity. I, I can only agree uh, with uh, the previous speaker that indeed the sense of insecurity is very relevant for the European uh, citizens, but it's not just the result of outside um, uh, threats, namely those coming from an emerging China or and uh, Putin's aggression uh, or uh, the proliferation of conflicts and our unpreparedness to deal with that, but it's actually the inside insecurity that comes from the fact that most citizens see that our governments don't have the moral authority, don't have the authority at all. Uh, uh, and, and that is uh, indeed what makes, for instance, the youth, not only we have an aging population, as Matt just highlighted, but we have as well uh, an unprepared youth who has not been to the jobs, even when they are qualified. And uh, of course, a segment of that use that is radicalized because, you know, don't fool yourselves with that talk about foreign fighters. They are our fighters. And the dangers are not coming from migrants. And, and by the way, we should not confund migrants with refugees. Indeed, the EU Turkey deal is an outrage because it's putting, it's damaging the authority of the Union in terms of human rights and the rule of the law because it really puts the European Union violating human rights and the rule of the law. And, uh, and it's because it's about, indeed, respecting our obligations, legal obligations, moral obligations, under the UN Convention on Refugees. Let's not confound refugees with migrants. And therefore, it all comes to leadership. Indeed, we have weak leadership in the EU. Weak, wobbly, fuzzy, not uh, answering the problems of uh, the, the people. That is fueled into the sense of insecurity. And what will be the outcome? I don't know. But I know what was the outcome of the 29 crisis. It was war. I don't want to see war in Europe. Frag more fragmentation in Europe is, will lead to war. I don't want that. I want a Europe that gets its act together. And for that, we need more Europe. I dare to say we need a federal Europe. Uh, Mr. Krustendevsky, how, how do you feel about that? Um, I agree with my speaker, I must say. Uh, you, you didn't mention one of the problems of, uh, of uh, European countries, which is connected. On, on the one hand, we, we have this uh, crisis with migration. But on the other hand, this is very paradox. We have a very a huge unemployment among youth. I don't know how, how, are, how are the figures in, um, in Portugal, in Spain, in, uh, everywhere, everywhere. So, so in the situation when uh, many of young Europeans uh, do not have a um, job, and we say, okay, solution is, is a huge, uh, is huge immigration, it's, uh, I would say it, it's, it's a little uh, too easy solution. When we are talking uh, with, uh, with experts, actually we have uh, in our political group, in European Parliament, a working group on demography. I am chairman of this group, and many specialists, for instance, in Germany, Harvick Birk said, no, you cannot stop aging of the European societies simply by, by immigration, that it should be a huge migration and not uh, any society, any society can survive this because uh, even in Germany we have now the new integration law and so you have also to integrate uh, migrants. So, and uh, talking to Poland, uh, I just, uh, I would say, you, you, you have to understand, we had never, until now, never any, any effective policy for families, uh, you know, increasing the uh, uh, birth rate and, and so on. This government, this new government, is the first one which uh, started effective uh, child uh, allowances and, and so on. And the acceptance in our part of Europe to accept the migrants, migrants from, also economic mi migrants from the East, is much higher than from the Middle East. Why? Because there are historical ties. There are many hundreds of Ukrainians working in Poland, and there, there are no problem, no tension, probably minor, but not in the, as a social problem, and, and so on. So I would say, generally, it would be very easy to say, okay, we are, uh, there are aging societies, just open up. I know that uh, 
that uh, President Obama praised uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel. But can you imagine an American president who said, okay, we cannot protect our border, uh, Willkommen's Kultur for Latin Americans in the United States. It's, a, it's just irrational policy. And this irrational policy created, for instance, in Germany, also AFD. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this is consequence of this policy. Before I leave you, Mr. Kostodewski, though, let me ask you this. I, you know, I've been coming to Poland for decades and um, watched Poland prosper. Mm. Uh, it has been the biggest recipient of EU subsidies in recent years. Mm. Um, uh, the roads, the infrastructure, fantastically improved over the time I've been coming here. And yet, um, the government that you, are, that, that you support um, is often described as you're a skeptic. And, um, uh, less than less than enamored of, of Brussels, shall we say? Um, does the label fit, and 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 uh, why is that? Given all the prosperity that comparatively Poland has enjoyed. No, no I wouldn't say we are eurosceptic. We are uh, euro realistic because, for instance, I share the opinion of uh, Ms. Gomes that uh, the European leadership is very weak. I had also the impression that they, they are detached from the societies. We can really very soon uh, lose our sense of reality sitting in the European Parliament and not getting out, you know, to see the people in Brussels, how they live and uh, how, they, how they really, what are their really problems. No, but uh, we, are, of course, acknowledge that, yeah, Poland is prosperous, achieved uh, many successes and, and so on, but we have to move in the in the in the next stage and uh, the government it is probably not now have very because this all, all is concentrating now about the, this discussion surrounding the questions of um, uh, concerning the questions of uh, uh, constitutional tribunal but we have very ambitious uh, ambitious uh, economic program we have also this is also this government who think that uh, this is now the time to have also a social policy, you know, after, yeah, after the really very dominance of neoliberal, as ideology, I would say, not really neoliberal, neo neoliberal thinking. It is just, uh, you know, inequality was growing and uh, social discontent everywhere in the society. And we have to, to combine this. These both moments, it's a new stage of uh, economic development with more just, uh, uh, just uh, uh, sharing also of this what was, uh, what, what, what was the success of the, of the last uh, the 27 years. Yeah. I want to move to other panels. So Mr. Szymanski, you wanted to add something quickly? Yes, so I'd like to add some Brief. remarks about the Euroscepticism of this government because yeah. I'm, I'm, I feel I'm a legitimate person to say a couple of words about it. I, yeah. I think the, this whole word, the, the, the whole concept of Euroscepticism as a nature of this government comes from the intellectual laziness because this is the easiest way to insult someone in Polish uh, political uh, circumstances to call them this this is uh, anti-European, uh, Euroskeptic, uh, skeptic, uh, and so on. I would say that we used to think about ourselves as a recipient of welfare and security from international cooperation and integration, including NATO and European integration. Law and Justice Party is one of the parties behind the Polish integration into European Union, and we stand in the same place since the 2003. I would say even more. We are ready to contribute to this project. We. I think after 12 years in the EU, after 17 years in the NATO, we should switch into a more um, contributory approach to the, to the European project, and we are ready to do it. And of course, this is less controversial, less provocative uh, aspect of my message. Probably a, a less welcomed aspect of my message is the second part of this. I would say it means, it, it doesn't mean that we are ready to accept any kind of solutions proposed by Brussels or any other capital from uh, European Union. It means that we want to have our own say about the future of Europe. It, me it means that we, we are not ready to be a passive audience of the European project because we see that we are in a real troubles and it doesn't come from nothing. We need a creative approach. And maybe that's why for some people who used to sit on the audience and hear only, 
uh, uh, it is so uh, amazing that someone would like to raise some questions and propose some, uh, some changes, propose an adaptation of the European Union, but it is not the Euroscepticism. I would pro propose to, to anybody uh, taking, into, uh, taking a part in this debate to switch from a preaching mode, and uh, mainly to Brussels, I would say, to change from preaching mode to more, more listening mode. Otherwise, we will be stuck. Otherwise, we will not adapt into a new realities. And, uh, and the risk is that we can uh, lose Europe as integrated continent. It, it, it is a great worry for this government. Yeah. Um, Madam Vice Prime Minister, uh, let me turn to you now. Uh, am I right that uh, despite all, all of its troubles, some of which we've just begun to discuss, Europe looks pretty good from Kiev? And, um, <laughs> And one other thought for you to also work on. Um, what do Ukrainians make of candidate Donald Trump's suggestion that unless Europeans do more to pay for NATO, he might not see much value in it as president? So two thoughts for you to consider. Well, thank you very much, David. It's, um, it's thrilling, actually, to be um, here from Ukraine and talk about European future, because we have actually really made a very conscious choice with regard to, to our future, and we would like to also be seen as a part of solution, as um, my colleague was just saying, uh, that, that we would also, in the longer run, in the midterm and longer term, we would like to be seen as, as those contributing to, to the um, flourishment of the European project. Uh, thus, uh, this, but at the same time, we definitely see a lot of a lot of issues that have been already discussed here um, um, in Europe. I think we also see the the kind of um, uh, the decline of the appeal of the European idea, and which is not being um, substituted by by some other idea. And, and so far, this va vacuum is being probably replaced more by um, um, some tendency of, of national egoism, if you can say that, and that could also lead to some, to, um, to, 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 to indifference uh, with regard to issues uh, of the others, and Ukraine being right now under a direct threat and being in need of uh, maybe some, some uh, engagement, direct engagement definitely is uh, cautiously watching these tendencies and, and uh, um, and, and worrying about those tendencies. However, um, and we see also, besides the things that, that have been mentioned here by co-panelists, so we see also a tendency of, of um, uh, discourse being basically um, uh, deviating from those uh, conservatives or liberals or centrists to a discourse between, within Europe, uh, between um, mm, Europeans or uh, pro EU and anti EU and we see this in a lot of in a lot of different countries and we still hope that Europe which is uh, based on, on really serious uh, uh, values uh, that we are we think are very much appealing to us is, is even though it's weakened but it's it hasn't lost yet and we think that it's very important that there will be enough power within Europe to actually get the, the act together and come back to those basic, basic important principles and things that, are, um, that have been appealing and, and empowering the nations around Europe for the last couple of decades and actually were appealing for Poles, were appealing for, for Czechs, for, for Lithuanians, for Estonians to, to join and to grow, uh, to grow and to prosper. So that's why uh, we are um, keeping hope that with, with our drive and belief as well, and our real fight for European uh, values and, and for, for the battle of those, uh, and our battle for those real, um, uh, like democratic, D democracy, human rights issues, uh, the, the issues of, of the indivisibility of borders, international law matters, civilized kind of approach to everyday matters would prevail also in Europe and Europe would stay uh, strong and united. And we really very much need that Europe would stay uh, uh, strong and united because we think that uh, from, from Ukraine it looks that, that threats to, to European project and to European uh, um, 
success in the future are lying not only in the, from the internal issues, but also it, there is a, a strong existential threat from outside. And um, unfortunately, that threat is, is just pulling these skeletons from the old cupboard. And those things that we thought that Europe has overgone um, long ago, um, unfortunately, they're again and again being um, put on the agenda for, for European um, nations right now. And, um, and we as Ukrainians feel this pressure on democracy, feel this pressure on, this, on society every single day, and we would want um, uh, countries in the European Union to actually pay, pay a very a serious attention that if the battle in Ukraine over Russia violating the international standards and European standards and, and human rights standards, uh, rule of law standards, if it succeeds in Ukraine, the chain rea it will be given, it will be feeling the, the carte blanche for itself and it will uh, um, um, trigger the chain reaction of rethinking the whole order which will actually influence Europe, which will actually um, which Europe will have to bear the consequences of. And so therefore, in this regard, um, I would just maybe jump to, to your other part of, the, of mm -hmm. your question, um, that in this regard, I think again, from the European Union side and from the NATO side, if Europe is uh, strong and united, if Europe keeps its transatlantic link strong and united, and if from the from the US is uh, there, there is uh, uh, the same engagement because it matters because of all the, you were starting with, with, um, um, with the ties that, that connect uh, Europe and the US. Um, and, and they are there, they are this uh, historical, civilizational, cultural, mental ties that are actually ensuring understanding of each other. So I do not, I do not see um, how, um, if elected, the new um, president, um, uh, if, if it's um, President Trump in the U.S., how he would easily um, cut this link of, of NATO and how, how he would not be feeling that this is a common space of security and a common space of values, a common space of, of, uh, of strength as well. It is the common strength for Europe and it's the common strength for, for the US and for Canada. So um, maybe we'll look a little bit more optimistic. We are knocking on that door right now, which is not that much any more appealing and maybe uh, someone thinks, okay, the wedding is over and, and um, you know people are almost getting divorced here. Why are you knocking? Why did you come to the wedding? But that's, uh, we are still very much, um, very much hopeful that those uh, um, values that were set up on this table for the wedding when people were signing, the, they are putting their signatures down, they really care and, and that, that, comp that uh, Europe is not about compromising values and it's not about compromising most important things and uh, that, that are, should be cherished, even though a lot of, of uh, challenges to this uh, and and um, a lot of appeal to, and, and intention to compromise the values is seen right now in Europe. Yeah. Dr. Telchuk, I've saved you for last. Um, coming in as the elder statesman, uh, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the gentlemen who did so much to help uh, Germany reunify, to, uh, to strengthen Europe. What is Europe now and where is it headed from your perspective? Well, this, this is the most uh, important question for me nowadays, and the main danger in Europe uh, is not Russia, is uh, not the wave of refugees. The main danger for me in Europe is uh, the disintegration of uh, Europe, renationalization of Europe. François Mitterrand once rightly said, nationalism means war in Europe. And I think he was absolutely right, and this is still true today. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, you see, we've, we've faced 
tremendous crisis. But if you look at the history of the European Union, it is a history of crisis. And uh, I worked with Chancellor Kohl for eight years to, to move ahead with the integration of Europe. And, uh, and uh, since that time, I'm in favor of crisis within the European Union because it's uh, one of the main engines for integration. And, uh, but uh, each crisis raises fears in the population. Uh, where is, Russia, where is uh, European, the European Union going? And uh, the, the main weakness of the Europeans is, just nowadays, a lack of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, look at my, I, I won't uh, discuss uh, partners, uh, other partners of the European Union, but look at Germany. Um, our Chancellor, talking about Europe, all the time says, we need more Europe. But she never will describe in detail what that means. Uh, and uh, if you read uh, the agreement between the, the Christian Democratic Party and the Social Democratic Party uh, who are running together the government, uh, they have an agreement uh, signed before they started the new government. If you read that, the, uh, the outcome uh, or the, the, uh, the consequence of this agreement is uh, deepening the integration of Europe. But nobody tells that the public. Nobody tells the public where are we going uh, with Europe. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, I, I would be happy if Pol the Polish government would be ready to uh, uh, take the lead, not by, them, by themselves, but together with Germany and, and France. Germany and France was in the past the main engine, uh, the driving engine of integration. Since Poland is in, in uh, part of the, of the European Union, it was our opinion from the very beginning, Poland is as important as France for several reasons. Not only for the European integration, but how to shape the relationship with Russia as well. Yeah? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we, we, we tried it once with the Weimar, so-called Weimar Triangle, the meetings between France, uh, Germany, and Poland. But uh, this doesn't work just now. Uh, therefore, I do believe we have to overcome the crisis, the financial crisis. You see, it's, the financial crisis has calmed down, but nevertheless, it's not finally settled. And therefore, many citizens are afraid what will happen with their savings. Yeah? Mm -hmm. An aging society has a lot of people with savings yeah, for their pensions. What will happen to that? This is one of the uncertainties. And uh, then you, we, we have now the wave of refugees and migrants. You see, the mistake of the German governments in the past was telling the public we are not a country of, of immigration, but we have had all the time immigration. We had 12 million Germans after the Second World War. I am one of them, mm -hmm. coming from the East. Uh, then in the 60s, we invited Turkish mm -hmm. uh, so-called guest workers, yeah. because guest workers means they will go back once. Yeah? <laughs> uh, they didn't. Most of them didn't. Yeah. And they came from Anatolia the poorest part of Turkey. Uh, not well uh, educated, uh, not uh, trained, no, no, not skilled people. But we, more or less, we integrated them. You see, and in my company, BMW, you have Turks now for 40 years working in my company. Meanwhile, 90 different nations are working in a company like BMW. 
90 different workers. And it works. Yeah? Why shouldn't it work to get now Syrians? Yeah? Uh, so the problem of the refugees, again, is uh, uh, the fear that uh, among the refugees there are terrorists. And just yesterday, our police imprisoned four potential terrorists of the IS. And one of them was living in a refugee camp. And this is the main fear of the, of the people. You see that with, within these refugees, we, we get potential terrorists, whether it's many and uh, whether it's really at the end true, we don't know. Uh, therefore, many, many uh, uh, concerns and, uh, for example, uh, uh, others are the repercussions of the globalization. Why does it, why is it possible that our closest ally, the United States and the Europeans, who try now to establish a common free market area, TTIP, yeah? transatlantic free trade area. Why it is so heavily questioned in, in Europe? You see 500, Euro 500 million Europeans and 350 million uh, Americans, plus Canadians and Mexicans, if you, NAFTA, if you took them together, we would be, have a free market of one billion roundabout, similar to China and India. We need that for the fu in the future. But uh, I'm afraid that it won't work at the end. Yeah? Because of s simple concerns, of silly concerns. Uh, and for me, this is, uh, David, not only an economic issue, it's a political issue. To to uh, bind the uh, United States and Europe closer and closer together. We have to do that because of the global, of a multipolar world. Yeah. But that's good yeah. enough now. I, I want to turn to questions in just a minute. I'm going to ask the Polish delegation, however, to give us one follow-up. Both of you gentlemen has to comment. Could, could one of you give us a, a, a yeah, quick... Please, me, 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 one information. Schumacher. To Mr. Telczyk, I think it's a good news that uh, in less than two weeks in Warsaw, uh, I will host uh, Europe ministers from Paris and Berlin in a Weimar Triangle format to consult the future of Europe, of course. So uh, the information about the death of Weimar Triangle are not confirmed. And we will try to revive it. Of course, we know where we are and we know what kind of challenges we, we have ahead of us, but, but we will uh, maintain this, this consultation format for sure. The second problem is even more complicated, I think. We, it's obvious that we, that we are losing a leadership in Europe, but uh, we have to ask ourselves why we are losing leadership in, in Europe, why m more and more people are not so trustful for the political class, not so trustful for the, um, for the, for the establishment. I think there are obvious reasons for this, and we have to listen to this very carefully, not preaching them, uh, listen carefully. Uh, that's precondition for reintegration and uh, restoration of, of leadership. That, that's obvious from my uh, perspective. And because th this is not the society and democracy which is under stress right now. The, the society is, is, is just start, has just started to talk to us with democratic uh, um, format, with, uh, with whole beauty of, of democracy, with, with unproportional assessment, emotional reactions, uh, probably ahistorical comparisons, etc. Et That's the beauty of democracy. We, we can't deny it. We, we have to be more inclusive, and that, this is the first step to restoration of real leadership okay. in, in Europe. Okay, thank you. Crown Only two, two, two sentences. Yeah, uh, one sentence, one remark. Because you mentioned uh, Dr. Telczyk about you know French and uh, and German leadership, and uh, 
But unfortunately, I think one of the problem of contemporary Europe is that, that this doesn't work anymore. So the dominance of, uh, of one country, we all know frustration in France, we know that uh, Britain is a side, and, and so we need a more, I think, balanced power structure in Europe. This is one, one remark. The second remark, you condemned nationalists. Of course, we all condemn nationalists, but uh, we shouldn't forget that Europe is built on nations. And especially German unification shows us how important we are national identity, how strong is national identity. Um, and uh, so th this is the difference to United States of America, and we should respect uh, our cultures, our sovereignty, also democracy on the national level, and our national parliaments, and our national, na national choices and, and decision. Okay, so uh, l let's, let's open up now the questions from the floor, and maybe some lights would be helpful, because I can't see you out there very well. Uh, Anders, I do see, so I'll let him go first. While, while we bring up the lights, if we could, a little bit, please. Uh, Anders Åstlund, Atlantic Council. Uh, first, uh, a question to Ivana Klumpus in Sinsadze. Uh, you are just uh, recently appointed uh, Deputy Prime Minister for European Integration. Thank you very much for coming here. And uh, my question to you is simple. Which are your three top priorities for what you want from the European Union in the next year. To Mr. Telchik, uh, very much appreciated what you said, and I would like to bring out one issue in this context, Nord Stream 2. Mm -hmm. uh, it would follow from your argument that uh, you would be against such a Russian-German initiative against the European Energy Union, or how do you look upon it? Thank you. First. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Aslund. Uh, glad to see you here. Um, for Europe, I think we as Ukrainians would very much welcome the credibility of our dialogue with the European Union as such. And this, first of all, right now corresponds to, and it's not about a year, because I was planning a little bit differently a month and a half ago ago when I was appointed, but now there are some more important and more urgent issues that are coming up right now. One is with regard to a uh, decision that you, the European Union, the European Parliament and Council of the um, uh, EU would have to make is about visa-free regime for Ukraine when Ukraine has actually fulfilled all the responsibilities and all the commitments, all the obligations, all the plans and all the requirements mm -hmm. on this way, uh, even though the, the decisions were pretty difficult in some cases. So we would anticipate that Europe would react accordingly and not uh, postpone the decision based on some political uh, grounds and would assess on, on um, a separate marriage seat each of the country that she is discussing this issue with and not under pretext of suspension, additional suspension mechanism would go into a further delay uh, because it's something about expectation from the other side as well. So that's one. Another thing is we would expect, again, I would return back to, to unity of uh, the European Union and transatlantic union in this case as well with regard to strong and very cohesive stance on the sanctions towards Russian Federation, which is not delivering anything on the, on the side of the Minsk Accords from, from its side. Uh, that's the second one. And I think we are very much hoping that um, something that has been the reason for revolution of dignity in Ukraine and the result of the, uh, the um, revolution of dignity in Ukraine uh, that's the association agreement and DCFTA that is being used right now only to, um, um, in, in a temporary uh, format, the, the whole process of ratification will be f finally finalized with the decision that would be a w wise and very cautious decision that would be placed by Dutch government on the table. Uh, to finish this whole process, because this is again not only a very important trade instrument for us and for Europe, I think is also a very beneficial trade instrument, but also a very sy symbolic matter for Ukrainians who have lost their lives um, over this um, over this this um, basically agreement, and we're we're dying um, in the in the center of Kiev under the flags of the European 
Union. And on a more practical basis, I, I understand that we are all uh, very much, you know, trying to see our uh, our different trade opportunities. And here we would be very much interested in in quicker, faster liberalization of trade because uh, because as you are feeling uh, pressure from, as you Europeans are feeling pressure from. Um, your losses economic-wise, believe me, um, as of 1st of, of uh, January of 2015, when, when, our, um, when basically all the import to Russian Federation was halted and, um, by Russian Federation from Ukraine, and the transit has been made almost impossible to the third countries of uh, Central and Eastern, uh, Central Asian countries, so we are definitely looking for for the additional mechanisms uh, all over the world, how to compensate and work and, and deliver um, in this in this well, respect. Thank you. Uh, Nord Stream 2? Well, uh, just to come back to one of the last remarks. Uh, when I was in office, uh, it was we have had a clear-cut goal for Europe. Uh, it was called the United Nations of Europe. And uh, who does not agree within the European uh, com uh, Union, uh, let those who want to establish it move ahead. And the others can stay out. Uh, uh, and uh, therefore, I'm very much in favor of a core of, uh, of uh, European uh, nations who want to establish a, an integrated union, a supranational Europe. Whether this is now possible is a different question, but uh, this was our official goal. It's not a copy of the United States of, Un of America. We can shape it as we want to, uh, and uh, I think uh, this is possible. And at my time, we, uh, we said, if it doesn't work with others, we start together with France. Yeah? Uh, as a core group, and who want to join us, okay, fine. If not, it's fine as well. But that others who are not interested in such uh, uh, goals uh, try hard to prevent it, that's not acceptable from my point of view. But what about North Stream? Well, for example, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, the, but I'd really like to have you answer the question because I think North yeah, Stream 2 raises back. a real, I will a real issue. Back. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, Nord Stream, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I have no problems uh, for energy supply by, by Russia. We had uh, for decades, even in the, at, the, at the time when the Cold War reached uh, its uh, peak, yeah, we had uh, 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 energy supply by, by Soviet Union and by Russia, and it always works. Therefore, I have no reason uh, to complain. Uh, whether we need now Nord Stream 2, well, uh, we will see. I, I can't, I'm not an expert now on that issue. Uh, I, I would say let's try to harmonize it with the energy policy of the European Union. Uh, if it works, it's better than, a, than, a, than an extra uh, solution. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's get to the table. Uh, is there a lady, perhaps, in the room? Well, there's a lady in the middle there. Uh. Thank you very much, uh, Mushira Khattab from Egypt. I uh, really enjoyed uh, the discussion in this panel. I think it tilted the balance with the uh, focus yesterday on Putin as the uh, threat to Europe or the EU. I want to ask concerning refugees, and I'm glad to hear the need of Europe for the refugees. Is there any uh, attention paid to the brain drain on the countries of origin and the problems of family dislocation and social problems affecting these countries? Thank you. Matt, would you like to, or, or uh, Anna? Yeah, well, uh, the brain drain is indeed a very serious problem for the countries of origin, but some of the countries of origin, either because involved, they are involved in conflict or because they have regimes that oppress the people, are actually the responsible, uh, very much responsible, not the only ones, but for the, the, the fact that the people have to flee. 
uh, but uh, that concern is not also present in Europe. We have had, for instance, I think that my country, with the most qualified youth, which is the product of tremendous investment by Portugal, but as well by the European Union, has also been the object of a brain drain because of the way we have not been uh, administering well, uh, responding well to the uh, economic crisis. Uh, I just would like to say, uh, but please understand my comments, and I, I do, yes, I'm very critical of the EU leadership, not just the Commission, but the Member States, our leadership, our government's leadership, but from a European perspective. And I believe that uh, in the same way that neoliberalism did not serve, does not serve us in the economy, also illiberal democracy also is not compatible with EU values and will not deliver to the European citizens and will not deliver a stronger Europe. And uh, in what concerns, I must say, Poland, I'm sorry to say, but the, and I agree very much that Poland ought to be part of that core Europe and has been a great success story. But if uh, indeed the perception is that Poland is not just a matter of uh, Euroscepticism prevailing, but actually uh, the rule of the law being in question, then of course it will be difficult. And I wish to have Poland in that core Europe, definitely. Okay, well now that you've raised that question, I have to let uh, our Polish friends respond, but uh, let me tee it up for you. Uh, those in the audience, uh, probably everyone is aware, but in case there's a few that aren't, there's an issue over the courts and the appointment of, of judges to the senior most court, court to the top court in, in Poland. And critics say that the government um, is, is uh, trying to uh, avoid uh, having judges on the court who were legally appointed uh, because uh, it wishes to uh, control the courts. Um, Mr. Szymanski, you need to respond to that. Yeah, I spent a lot of time talking about constitutional affairs, being a European minister, so I'm used to, 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 to respond for this kind of question, of course. I think it's a little bit more complicated. We, we have uh, at least uh, three judges elected in October and not sworn, being not uh, a judge at the moment, and we have another three sworn, uh, so it means that we have elected at least 18 judges, it's hard to allocate them in, in the same time. So it's a little bit more complicated. There is no intention to block the, the constitutional court. There is no intention to, um, to uh, maintain the crisis situation. We share with the European Commission the same analysis where we should do something, but we do not share the strict recommendation, very strict recommendation on systemic aspect of, of the law. So it is not that simple, and I do not agree that uh, we can say anything strong about the concept of illiberal democracy, because I really don't know what does it mean. I think we have a democracy, uh, the democracy can evolve, can be more adaptive, let's say, uh, but I don't know what, the, what, what well, would let, let it me, mean, me and who would judge where are the borders of liberal well, and illiberal. I would prefer well, to one stick of the, one to of the, the borders. One of the borders would be where the uh, executive controls the judiciary. That would be illiberal. Yeah. There, there is no controversy about it. There is no controversy about the, 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 this question, but there is no controversy about the rule of law. But there is a controversy about the implementation, that's all. I think the whole process is a little bit ex exaggerated and uh, I will assure you that we will find a proper solution. And it's a little bit too early to say that uh, we have any risk of so-called liberal democracy in, in Europe. We have a democracy which is evolving in many other countries. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, I think, the problem of leadership, we have a problem of adaptation in many other countries. And we try to find a proper response. That's all. The society is, has started to talk to us and we are trying to listen. That's all, nothing, nothing special, I would say. It's in times of crisis, if I can uh, follow the, the, the line about the core Europe. In times of crisis, usually, we tend to think that uh, we should find a very simple solution to fix the problem. We see that many member states, probably almost all of them, have different opinions about the future of Europe and different opinions, not fully happy uh, about the European Union itself. Uh, I would prefer to 
understand why so many people are so, feel so uncomfortable with some aspect, sometimes very narrow, very sectoral aspect of integration, mm -hmm. to respond to this, not to preach again. I think the core union is one of the simplest story. We hear it from, from 1994, I think. But I would like to, to ask, what does it really mean, a core union? Is it a union of transfers? Is it a union of uh, a super state? Is it a federal union? Because if we would go a little bit farther with the definition of the core union, it would mean, it we would understand very clearly that there is no hurry to join that any kind of core union at the moment. I'm not sure if anybody is ready to join Berlin uh, design core union, maybe a part of Netherlands. I'm not sure if anybody is hurry up to join the French design of core union at the moment, maybe a part of Belgium. So it is not the real solution because we have much more complicated questions to be solved and uh, paying a price with the scale of the, of the integration is, is not a uh, proportional um, answer for the crisis right. we have. Okay, um, look, I wanna go out back to the, to the audience again. We have a few more minutes. Uh, I see one in the second row there, sir, and I see one in the front, too. Okay. Thank you. My name is Ignacy Guardans. I'm a former member of the European Parliament and a lawyer now in private life. Uh, yesterday, Prime Minister Cameron gave his first interview uh, in the Remain campaign, and he portrayed the European Union as a horrible institution where judges from Bulgaria, Portugal, and Spain, strange places, can decide over the UK citizens, where lots of people from outside the UK can come and work in the UK. So it is, it is a, an institution he really criticized, but an institution that is needed for the UK to preserve its jobs and its wealth. So that's the best we can get in the UK, you know? That's the Remain campaign. <clears throat> that's, the, that's the pro huh, side of that. Hmm? Uh, so, that's, here comes my question. I mean, you're all asking about uh, and discussing leadership, the need for a stronger Europe, and so on. So, why is Brexit a negative thing? Why is Brexit a negative thing for the European Union? Why do we need the UK in, and with the guarantees that they have got uh, from the European Council, in which we will, if they remain, we will need to confirm in the treaties that there's no... Uh, uh, ever stronger union, that we need to allow them to stop the circulation of workers within the union and other stuff, which of course might be replicated by other countries, instead of having a perfect UK as a neighbor, a very close neighbor, where we can share security concerns, we can have them as partners in NATO, we will have some sort of internal market as we have in Norway and Switzerland, and we'll have an ever stronger union with a strong leadership. So okay. I would like to hear from you, why is Brexit a bad thing? If it is for you. All right, any, anyone from the panel? Well, I would say it's another huge debate, but uh, definitely we, uh, the, the main consequences of Brexit is indeed the consequences of the divorce. In itself, it would be horrendous uh, for Britain, but as well for the Union. Uh, and then I, I believe that despite all the mistakes that Cameron himself made by actually leading Britain to this referendum, we need Britain. We need Britain in the EU. And we need to, it's, it's part of our way to deal with the current leadership crisis and indeed integration crisis. Uh, because they are linked, obviously. And uh, <laughs> with it. Mr. Krasnodevsky. My way to summarize. Uh, uh, just uh, one remark to the, to, the, to, to the previous point in our discussion. I, I will agree with you probably that Illiberal democracy is not uh, consistent with the, with the European values. There's the question, what does it mean? But would you agree with me that also liberal post-democracy is not, not consistent with European values? Post, um, liberal post-democracy. This, this, this is one. And probably liberal post-democracy is more actual danger actually for, for European Union that's, than illiberal democracy. But that would be, you know. I did a, not craft we, we, the, the, we, the we oxymoron of illegal democracy. This. 
but I, I was not the one who, cra who crafted that oxymoron. Yeah. I think it's yeah. an oxymoron. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not uh, not oxymoron. I could. Uh, I there could, is no uh, democracy no, without no, liberal it, 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 liberalism in politics. Liberal post democracy. There are many leading po uh, European scientists, uh, social scientists, Colin Crouch, for instance. We're, sp yeah. we're presumably talking about but, liberal but, with a small but, L, right? But to, uh, back to, to Brexit. I am not, I, I, must, I must say, this is my personal view. I am not a member of the Polish government. I'm not, I am not even a member of the Law and Justice Party. I am ordinary MEP. For me, the most, uh, the, the, the greatest danger for European Union is business as usual. And I am afraid that uh, Britain will vote to stay, that the, our leader, European leader, say, okay, it's everything, okay, let's go to ever close the union further and then so on. So I, I would say I am not really sure, and also our uh, British uh, colleagues are divided, as you know, probably now in the delegation. I'm not really sure what would be better for Europe. A kind of shock, positive shock, like uh, sometimes where the, the people vote against some, some you know, European uh, regulation. Because I, I, am, I am also thinking that probably because of this shock, we could, could make Europe a bit better, European Union. We will start the discussion, we will, because this, uh, you know, what, what is also the danger, I, th I think, according to me, it is the self-confidence of the, of, the, of the European elites. It's everything, okay, no, the societies are wrong, yeah? And we have to, you know, how to, to deal with this society, but actually, we, uh, the, the best thing is to ignore them. And I think in this sense, I am not really convinced that the Brexit is something wrong for European Okay, so let, let, me, let me take it there. Uh, uh, Dr. Telchuk, I'm going to give you the last word because we're out of time, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, uh, so I'll make it short. Uh, well, uh, I am asking all members of the European Union, why have they been so eager to join the European Union? And now being in, uh, publicly discussing uh, whether the EU is good enough or not. Uh, and uh, if uh, the, the Brits uh, will decide now in their refer referendum to leave, then they will leave, then they are out. And uh, look at the history. Uh, the goal was preventing the first uh, accession. And uh, how the Brits fought heavily to join uh, later on uh, 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 the European Union. We wish I, I'm in favor of Great Britain uh, to be part because it's a, count, a kind of counterweight to France. You see, France on economic issues mainly. Uh, the Brits are more market-oriented uh, uh, people than the French. And when we st started to establish the, the uh, 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 single market, Margaret Thatcher was very helpful to convince uh, 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 Mitterrand to move ahead in the right way. Therefore, uh, we need good people. And Brits have brilliant people and sometimes boring people. Uh, I, had, uh, I had to brief Margaret Thatcher on behalf of the Chancellor several times. Uh, it, was, it was always fun because she's, she was always listening and uh, you always, she always had clear-cut positions, and this is one of the advantages of the Brits. They have clear-cut uh, positions, whether you like them or not. But it's easier to deal with a politician knowing what he wants. Very good. Well, uh, it's been a fascinating uh, discussion, very diverse and varied uh, different uh, perspectives provided. I hope you found it interesting. I'm sorry to bring it to a close. I'd like to go on for another hour. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but the, I, I'm, I have a few things, a few uh, housekeeping notes. Lunch will now be provided uh, in the bistro and terrace. Uh, the next session begins promptly at 1.30, a little over an, uh, a little over an hour from now, in, here in the auditorium. It's titled NATO's Future and the Warsaw Summit. Uh, and for those interested, there's also a digital summit session entitled Roundtable Dialogue on Innovation and the Digital Economy. The pa panel begins, that panel begins at 1.30 p.m on the lower level in room A. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done, panel. Thank you.